So I am so excited here to have one of my oldest friends, Logan Browning, who is also one of the people that I admire and look up to for so many different reasons. And first, I want to thank you, Logan, for spending time with me today. I don't know, Natalia, you called me your oldest. One I said of your one of, one of my <laughs> longest, one of my longest lasting friends. There we go. <laughs> longest lasting friendships. But over the years, Logan and I have had so many deep and meaningful and thoughtful discussions and, and we learn from each other and sometimes we disagree and sometimes we teach each other new things and it always comes from such a really good place. And I'm really excited to share these kinds of conversations that we have regularly with with everyone, especially at such a crucial, crucial time. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I want to focus this conversation in particular on words and the power that they hold because our conceptualization of language is inevitably shaped by our own experience. I was kind of digging into these terms that are being thrown around and one of them is defund the police. And what I find really interesting about that is you can be having a conversation with someone and with that same expression, the word defund is the word that strikes fear in some people, but for others, it's the word police. And so how can we ever even begin to resolve these issues that need to be addressed if we're both coming from completely different emotional places or a different understanding? It goes as far back into looking at the history of the police originating as slave catchers, or if you were to compare neighborhoods and you see a, a thriving upper class, predominantly white community, you see that they're not heavily policed and they're safe. Why? Because the community is investing in the community. They're allowed to take care of each other. You look at black or brown, not as a fluent community, and you see that they're heavily policed and they're also not safe. So when Black Lives Matter refers to defund the police, it's looking at those two ideas of this American life and also the police's integration in, into the communities. And instead of continuing to fund the things that are killing these communities and keeping these communities from thriving, why not put that money and investing into the systems that would actually keep our community safe. When I see a cop car, I tense up. And that goes to my own experiences. I'm not gonna say that I've never had a, a pleasant experience with someone in a uniform. That would be not my truth. But I have had unpleasant experiences with people in uniform. My first time getting pulled over was when I was 16 years old and I, had, my brother and I had left our, our job. We both worked at the same restaurant after school. And I was driving my mother's car and I didn't realize that her headlights had to be manually turned on. Yeah. And as soon as I pulled out of the restaurant that was a well-lit restaurant, I just, my luck, a police was the first other car on the road. They see me without the headlights on, they immediately pull me over two cops approach either side of my car, one with a gun drawn and his flashlight. That is, That was my very first experience of getting pulled over, was having, in the middle of the night, having someone tapping on my window with their flashlight and having, and I saw it in my side view mirror, it was the gun and the flashlight. That's how he literally came to my, I was 16 with my 15 year old brother in the car. And then another cop on the other side was interrogating my brother as this one's interrogating me and, and I'm like trying to manage my brother being like, please don't, don't talk to them. Like you don't have to talk to them. And I eventually had to ask my brother to call my dad because I didn't know what to do. And honestly, I still don't think I have reconciled that trauma because I don't remember what happened after my dad got there. So you couple that with then what I've seen people who look like me endure. I've seen them murdered. I've seen them. And I hate when people say murdered unjustly, like no police should not be murdering people at all. Yeah. And it's not. Un okay. Speaking of language, murder unjustly is an oxymoron. Justice 
is when you go to court, you have a trial and you are convicted. Yeah. So a murder is never just, it's, it's murder. <laughs> and yeah, that's never, yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but I'm going my No, time. that was, I was kind of tan going on different tangents anyway, yeah. but just, just in general, the American dream is anyone can come into this land and work hard and succeed and provide a great life for their family. That's what it is. And then it, it leads me into thinking about the roadblocks to the American dream. So when you think about Black Lives Matter and the police, it's really a conversation about the lack of being able to exist, the lack of being able to thrive in your own communities. So if, if we're not willing to protect the people in this country who have never been able to survive, then I, I just, I think that the concept of the American dream, the concept of liberty for all, the concept of everyone being equal, it's just farce. The words lose their meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, I think in a way we, we have been sold this idea through our education system and our in institutions that we had slavery, we fixed it, we moved on. Oh, and then there, then there was a civil rights movement and they fixed whatever else was left. And then cool, racism was over. And then we voted in the black president and it was done. And that's kind of what the history books teach you. And they skip over reconstruction. They skip over. It was always like, like two steps forward and three steps back. And then the Voting Rights Act comes in and it was literally just them fighting to get what they had already won. And mm -hmm. it's just this constant struggle of moving forward and moving backwards. And I, I am a big believer in reaching across the aisle. And I think communication is probably the most important thing. And at the same time, I also want to be cognizant of the fact that I'm saying that coming from someone who really hasn't ever faced any type of oppression in my life. I've never, I've never truly had to go and reach across the aisle and have a conversation with someone who, who genuinely doesn't acknowledge my right to exist as equal to them. And so someone in, in a lecture I was at the other day said something that really stuck with me. She said that expecting those who are oppressed to listen to their oppressors at that same level is unfair. We're placing an unfair burden on those people. And that really struck me because I'd never thought of it that way before. So I guess I wanted to know how do you cope with, with this, this constant battle? If I am to think back, I definitely had those moments that were, that were extremely overwhelming because I had conversations with people who I, like it hurt my heart to even talk to them. But I think that what this moment in time made me realize is this fight and these conversations and the necessary cultural movements and things, They've, they've been happening even while we were dormant in our activism, even while we were not paying attention. Like I think about Black Lives Matter and the fact that they're in front of um, Jackie Lacey's office every Wednesday. You know, that didn't start when all of this happened. So I guess it's just, it was a reminder to me when all of this happened that obviously it was important for, for everyone to try to capitalize on that moment and, and get as many people on board with caring as possible even if they're not, you know, paying attention every single day afterwards. But it, it helped me remember that every single day that there is a fight, that there's just so much work to be done. I'm curious to know what you think is the most productive response to all lives matter. <laughs> that may be just a smile. <laughs> is it worth engaging? Because I, again, it goes back to communication. I still firmly believe that Communication is everything and we got to talk to people. But again, I, I get it. Like you just want to throw your hands up and be like, I'm not even going to engage with this. Well, well, then here's when people say black lives matter, no one is saying black lives matter, comma. And, and then like, and then like a clause. only, like, <laughs> only. Yeah. There's no clause. It's just like, Hey, we matter. And, and I think that 
I don't know, I guess a productive, res I, hadn't, I have never thought of a productive response to All Lives Matter. I, I think you're right in like, obviously we should be able to have these conversations to like build the bridge. But you really think about if someone, if their thinking has gone that far, sometimes I feel like even my most productive response is not going to save them from that kind of thinking. I, I guess I almost come to an impasse and I go, you know what, my most productive response is to continue to protect the black lives. Because if I spend my productive time trying to teach you why, why black lives matter is important, if I'm spending my time trying to teach you that, then I'm not protecting us. You're actually a distraction. And, and that distraction is dangerous and that distraction is deadly. Yeah. And, and I'm smarter than that. It's like if, if we're out, I don't know, I'm, I'm picturing this like field of, I don't know, it's like a war zone. And like, I have someone going like, why are you, why are you picking that person up? You know, they're gonna, they're gonna die anyway. Why are you doing that? And I'm like, if I stand here and argue with you about why I'm doing it, they're going to die. But if I actually take my time to go save them, then they have a chance. So I can't sit here and argue with you about why it matters. Like you can watch me do it and maybe you'll learn from that. I love that. One thing that you did mention a bit earlier that actually really, I guess pun intended, excited me was to change our perspective and actually be excited about this. And even just hearing you say that, I got, I was like, oh, you know, like I got all <laughs> like tingling. And so, you know, like this is an opportunity. And if we just change those words, right? It, it, isn't it amazing what that can do? I mean, with all the racism that's on the forefront and since the protests, but also we're seeing it in our administration at the highest levels of government. We're seeing it today with COVID-19, which is just bringing all of these inequalities front and center to, to a point where it's just, it is impossible to ignore for so many reasons. And I hear people say, oh, I just can't wait for things to go back to normal. I think it, they think shouldn't go back to normal. No. They, they shouldn't. And even though this is such a devastating and really traumatic time for so many people, it, it's also a really like once in a generation opportunity. And I love the way that you frame this as an exciting moment. So I guess what are you excited about when you look ahead and, and see the opportunity that we're placed with what what gets you going what gets you up in the morning i think that something that's excited me recently is i i, I love to surround myself with very smart opinionated people who are well versed in their own thing because i love being challenged i love being wrong Actually, I, I mean, I hate being wrong, but then I love when someone really shows me that I'm actually wrong. And then I have to like re kind of research and discover for myself my opinion on something or my understanding of something. So all of that to say, when I first heard the phrase defund the police, I was like, wait, what? I don't understand. I mean, like, yeah, police reform, right? Like, what, what do you mean defund the police? And as I continue to learn about it, I was like, oh, light bulb, this is a great. So even defunding the police segues into reimagining our criminal justice system and mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex, the way we know it. And when you look at transformative justice and restorative justice. I love that word. There are concepts that have been around for a very long time that I'm only recently uncovering. And you can start to see that there are alternatives to justice. And it's not that they're easier, right? But it's that idea of, wow, what if this was the way our world looked? And I think that's what's exciting me and that's what's getting me up every morning is realizing that I've existed with this status quo, this understanding that this is the way the world works, this yeah. is the way that justice works, but realizing when that light bulb has gone off and I'm like, oh wow, if I take the time, I can really educate myself on these alternatives and then I can also pass it on and we can all imagine really a safer world. Yeah. I think those are some of my favorite words that have come out of this whole conversation. It's reimagining, reconceptualizing, breaking down these concepts that 
have just been handed to us that we've accepted without questioning. But the idea of having agency over your destiny and the society that you want to live in and this incredible opportunity to reimagine the mechanisms of how we all fit in together, I think is, is an unbelievably exciting opportunity. And I think if we think of it in those terms, like you said, it is hard, but I don't know. I would argue that going back to normal would be much harder in the yeah. long run. So I guess my final question for you is, what do you say to people who tell you that, you know, you're just an actress, stay in your lane? I say... <laughs> That was kind of a leading question, too, because I know where you're going to go with this. Well, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think, one, in 2020, at the very least, I feel like people understand more that no one is monolithic in their identity and even in their passions and mm -hmm. in their professions. So I think it's wild that people think that when someone has a certain profession that garners them this platform that then they have to just only do this one thing and be stuck in a box. Like, honestly, even if someone thinks that I should be stuck in this box, I really to them say, I don't, I won't, I don't care. Like you don't govern me. Like I have autonomy over my own body. I have autonomy over my own passions and what I produce in my life. And I also would say that if you look at the history of the civil rights movement, of any movement, art is always at the center of it. Young people, art are at the center of every single movement. And if young people and artists stayed silent, this world would literally implode and <laughs> <laughs> it would be so bleak and so bland. And I also say that I use my art as my activism and that art influences people a lot right now. I mean, you look at the show I'm on, Dear White People has had a 600% surge of viewership right now. Why? Because people are looking for answers. What do you turn to? You turn to books, you turn to film, you turn to poems, you, like, you turn to music, you turn to art when you want to find the answers to your questions. So when people say that, I, I guess I would, I would hold up a mirror to them and ask them would they want to be so limited? You know, would they want to not be able to express themselves in all of the ways that they feel capable of? I love that. I think that's really beautiful. I think artist to artist, and I say this to you, but I also would say it to any other artist. I think we naturally have this tendency to be freedom fighters as artists. Like we're so emboldened, so impassioned. We put ourselves in so many character shoes. We experience, you know, so many different stories. I think one of the things that I've learned that I would pass on to any other artist is connect to an activist, connect to mm -hmm. an organization, because I think that that's something that I don't know if I necessarily did early on in my personal journey of wanting to be vocal. I, I think that it's important to make sure that you are amplifying the voices that are on the ground. Like we have to amplify the voices that are in the grassroots organizations because they're the ones doing the work. Like you said, you've seen this all the time too, where people, you know, artists can just go out and say what they want and it, it starts a movement. It starts people caring about something, but if they haven't really looked to the activists on the ground then they're missing a huge part of how to really move forward. It's like, let's build on these blocks and, you know, not be rogue, I guess, in our, ah, in our fight. Totally. I think that's really, really great advice. It, it almost takes off the pressure that you need to be the most well-read, well-spoken, informed, and like be a great actor and do all. It's like, no, you don't. We're a collective. We can all lean on each other and, and we all serve a purpose. Every single person in society can play a part in this and we can all help each other. No one should have to carry this burden alone. Yeah. And so I think that's, a, I think it's a really nice way to, to look at it. We all have a role. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I can't thank you enough. You've been so gracious with your time and generous and thoughtful and as always, and I adore you. So, Love so you too. Thanks for having me. <laughs>